I'm going to encourage you to take now a copy of the scriptures and turn to Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. If you don't have a copy, the words will be on the screen behind me. But Colossians chapter 4, beginning in verse 5. Act wisely towards outsiders, making the most of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you should answer each person. Tychicus, our dearly loved brother, faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord, will tell you all the news about me. I've sent him to you for this very purpose, so that you may know how we are, and so that he may encourage your hearts. He's coming with Onesimus, a faithful and dearly loved brother who is one of you. They will tell you about everything here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, sends you greetings, as does Mark, Barnabas' cousin, concerning whom you have received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And so does Jesus, who is called Justice. These alone of the circumcised are my co-workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, sends you greetings. He is always wrestling for you in his prayers so that you can stand mature and fully assured in everything God wills. For I testify about him that he works hard for you, for those in Laodicea and for those in Hierapolis. Luke, the dearly loved physician, and Demas send you greetings. Give my greetings to the brothers and sisters in Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. After this letter has been read at your gathering, have it read also in the church of the Laodiceans and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. And tell Archippus, pay attention to the ministry that you've received in the Lord so that you can accomplish it. I, Paul, am writing this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. Amen. To unwind on occasion, Elizabeth and I will watch some of those unique countercultural shows that you can find on just about every cable show or every streaming site. There's something compelling about watching people reject cultural expectations. Whether it's downsizing into a tiny house, no bigger than the bathroom in your home currently, or whether it's living self-sufficiently off-grid, watching these individuals do that all the while thinking, I'm not sure I could do that. I came across recently the story of Ken Smith. Filmmaker Heather Greenaway describes Ken like this. His picture is on the screen. Ken Smith is known globally as the Hermit of Trigue, and he's been living off-grid in the Scottish Highlands for more than 40 years. He's 74 years old. He decided to live on his own, as he says, or he decided to live life on his own terms after returning from Alaska in his mid-30s. So he walked from Heathrow Airport to an isolated woodland north of Fort William, where he decided to set up home miles from civilization in an area with no electricity or phone signal. It's a three-hour walk to get to his house. And part of me some hidden part of me thinks, like, that sounds amazing. And part of me thinks this guy must be absolutely nuts. <laughs> Living counterculturally often has that tension. Today, we wrap up our series in the book of Colossians. And frankly, Colossians is now going to have a very special place in my heart because it's the first book that we've gotten to walk through together as a church family. And as Paul finishes off this letter, as he says his goodbyes, and then as he takes the pen from the individual who has 
he was dictating the letter to as he takes the, the quill, the pen from that individual and begins to sign his own greeting. What he's doing is he's laying his finger on this reality. Jesus calls his church to countercultural activity. These art activities are a bit startling compared to the normal cultural air that we breathe. But they are everyday normal activities that Jesus is compelling new community, the church, and the local church engages in, ought to be pursuing radically, consistently, faithfully, and wholeheartedly. So this message is addressed primarily to those who consider themselves to be followers of Jesus. It is for those who have turned from their sin and their self-righteousness, for those who've placed their faith for present and future salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ as the true Son of God. And if that describes you this morning, then remember where we were in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. You have been raised with Christ, and therefore you've been enabled to live life on earth with a new, heavenly, countercultural perspective. And while these activities that the Lord Jesus calls us to engage in are undoubtedly difficult, we have been enabled by the Spirit of God within us and by your union with Jesus to participate as a church in these ways. And if you're exploring Christianity then my hope for you this morning is that you'll simply ask this question. What on earth is so powerful enough to change someone so drastically that he or she would embrace this type of countercultural ethic? So here's our big idea. Because we are united to Jesus, he calls us to countercultural acts. Because we're united to Jesus, he calls us to countercultural acts. And there are at least five of them that we read here at the end of Colossians chapter 4. So, number one, first, Jesus calls us to the countercultural act of honoring over shaming. Honoring over shaming. Even in the Christian community, shaming can be a powerful force. I recently heard of one pastor that stopped his sermon when someone got up to use the bathroom. The pastor told that individual, or told the whole church, that he was going to wait to continue his sermon until that individual was back in his seat. Does that make your skin crawl or what? Public shaming is a powerful cultural tool in many parts of our world. Dan Allender and Tremper Longman describe shame in this way in their book, The Cry of the Soul, a book I would highly recommend even as we think about jumping into the book of Psalms here starting this summer. The Cry of the Soul subtitle is How Our Emotions Reveal Our Deepest Questions About God. It's a book I cannot recommend highly enough. And here's what they say concerning shame. To be covered with shame is to feel the self engulfed in something disgusting, even hideous. It may seem extreme, but the experience of shame feels like a prolonged, tortuous death. And our culture gets a 4.0 GPA when it comes to shame-inducing. And let's be honest, we have absorbed this culture into our beings without even recognizing it. For example, how often is our sarcasm an attempt to cover our own shame or has the result of shaming another person? And how often is social media used not for the lifting up of those around, but for the debasing and dehumanizing and shaming of those who have a differing perspective on something? But notice what Paul does as he wraps up his letter. He calls out ten individuals. He names names. And he does so not to induce shame, 
but he labels these individuals with honoring titles. It's not flattery for Paul. It's reality. Paul is calling out the good and the beautiful and the true in his brothers and his sisters. And then the Holy Spirit enshrined that in the scriptures for the church to read for the last 2,000 years. Just listen to these descriptions. Dearly loved brother, faithful minister, fellow servant in the Lord, a faithful and dearly loved brother, they have been a comfort to me a servant of Christ Jesus, the dearly loved physician. And he honors Nympha, the lady in whose home the Laodicean church met. Paul even calls them to welcome and embrace Mark. Now, that may not seem like a big deal, but this was the same Mark who had, ab- who had abandoned Paul and Barnabas on one of their missionary journeys. Mark was actually the reason on a later missionary journey that Paul and Barnabas would part ways because Barnabas wanted to bring Mark again and Paul was going, no, we're not doing that again. I've seen that movie before. But here in this book, Paul calls the church to welcome and embrace Mark. There's no room for shame. There's no room for disgrace, only honor and dignity. One of the most disregarded verses in Scripture, and I know that's quite a statement, but I think it's true. One of the most disregarded verses in Scripture is Romans chapter 12, verse 10. Outdo one another in showing honor. There ought to be a competition within the local church to see who honors others the most outdo one another in showing honor. After all, though, it makes sense if we think about it, right? Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promise to his people that he would turn their shame into praise. And so on this side of eternity, we call one another out not to shame one another, but to honor one another, to point to the work of the Spirit of Jesus within each one of us. The reality is, just like we get blind spots where we need brothers and sisters to come along and point out, hey, this area of your life does not match the profession of your faith. Just like we have blind spots that way, so also we have blind spots to see the ways in which Jesus Christ is actively transforming us by his spirit into his image. And we need others to come to us and point out, point out in those ways where they are seeing evidence of God's grace in our lives. We need that encouragement. There was a point in my life where I could only see my brokenness and my weakness. I was full of shame and I could no longer hide it. So I had particular conversations I needed to have with men that I greatly respected about that weakness, about my brokenness. And one of those men looked me in the eyes and he said this, Isaiah, that took a lot of courage to have that conversation with us. I just want to honor you, honor that and acknowledge that and thank the Lord for that. And those simple words spoken by a brother removed my shame. They bestowed honor where I saw only brokenness and they made me realize in that moment that I was accepted Not just by these brothers, but I was accepted and loved in my mess by the Lord of these brothers, Jesus Christ. Now, I have to fight that battle to believe that every single day. Some days it's an all-out war to believe that I'm accepted by the Lord Jesus. And perhaps it is for you as well. And we all need someone to come alongside and call out the fact that the Spirit is at work in specific ways in our lives, even when we don't necessarily see it. So can you imagine what Sojourn Community Church could be like if it was a place known not simply for a friendly atmosphere where you'll be welcomed and received, but if it was known for a culture of honor, 
a culture that went above and beyond in calling out the good and the beautiful and the true in brothers and sisters, if life became a competition among us not to get ahead, not to outdo everyone else in whatever cultural measure of success or standard, but rather if we were seeking to outdo everyone else and honoring everyone else. How counterintuitive, how countercultural. But that is one of the activities that Jesus calls to. And that sort of culture kills the fear of being overlooked, forgotten. It kills the instinct to protect one's rights and to fight for one's place in a community. It allows us to truly focus on others in a self-forgetful way, in a way that honors Jesus for it honors His work among our brothers and sisters and it honors our Father when we honor His image bearers. There's countercultural power in the act of honoring one another. Second, Jesus calls us to the countercultural act of serving over spectating. Of serving over spectating. You can't read the end of Colossians 4 without being struck by the note of labor, of work, of service for the sake of others. The ideas of ministering or serving, of being a servant, of being a worker, of working hard, of fulfilling one's service are all over these verses. So let me ask you a question as we kind of dive into this a bit deeper. How do you understand church? The answer to that question is important. How you perceive the church will define how you engage with the church. If we understand church merely as a gathering, merely as an event, then we're going to show up as spectators because that's what you do at an event. But if we view the church as a group of people, a community of people following Jesus whom God has called out and brought to, to himself to demonstrate and to declare his glory and his honor, then we will show up to that community to serve them and thus to serve God. And this sort of service does not happen over live stream. It can't. It happens in person as we fellowship with one another Sunday to Sunday and throughout the week. So at this particular season, as elders, we believe that this is one area God is calling us as a church family to grow into. We are in danger right now of burning out our weekly volunteers that make this gathering possible. Especially when it comes to areas like Sojourn Kids. We are currently running only two-thirds of a full Sojourn Kids ministry, and we're doing it with only about half of the idea ideal volunteer capacity. That means we are asking you as a church family, we're inviting you to step in and fill a need. Now we'll provide the background checks and the training for all of this that's necessary, but we need folks who are willing to step into these spaces to serve. So to simply continue on what we're doing right now on a Sunday morning, we need 12 additional volunteers. And that will allow us, and that will allow those volunteers to serve just one Sunday a month, allowing them to be in this gathering the other three Sundays in a month. However, Jess, our children's ministry director, would like to open our third classroom to serve children six years old and older as we have more families that would benefit by this. But to make that happen, we need an additional 10 volunteers on top of that 12, which would give us a total of needing 22 more volunteers. And that would mean those individuals would serve just one time a month. And parents who are currently blessed by the ministry of Sojourn Kids, I know it may seem like Sunday morning is the perfect opportunity to catch a break from little voices and little needs. But if you use the Sojourn Kids ministry, you can be a blessing to other parents who 
by giving up one Sunday a month to care for and disciple children within our church family while others do the same for you the other three Sundays of the month. So as a church, let's consider in the next day or two if this is one way that we can show up and serve our Savior by serving our brothers and sisters as well as guests who walk through our doors. And you can reach out to our Sojourn Kids Director Jess by emailing kids at sojournchattanooga.com or use the QR code in front of you in the chair back pocket. So Jesus calls us to the countercultural activities of honoring and of service. But third, Jesus calls us to the countercultural act of hoping rather than despairing. I'm not sure if you've noticed this, tongue-in-cheek. Our world is full of despair and outrage. And it really shouldn't surprise us. Because when idols are uncovered to be the gods that can't save, worthless, lying deceivers that can't deliver us as human beings made in God's image, then there's no other appropriate response but despair and rage until another idol fills its place. And until Jesus is seen to be the king that he is by any individual, then that culture of despair will reign supreme. But listen to what Paul says. After listing off the work of five individuals at the beginning, Paul says this, These alone of the circumcised are my co-workers for the kingdom of God. And they have been a comfort to me. The kingdom of God. That phrase is packed with significance in Scripture. In fact, at some point, we will probably do an entire series built around this phrase, the kingdom of God. Graham Goldsworthy has done much work in this particular study of the scriptures and his definition is so simple and so helpful when it comes to what is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is God's people under God's rule in God's place. God's people under God's rule in God's place. We don't have time to dive into all the nuances of that definition this morning, but throughout this letter, Paul has been knocking on this point Jesus is king. He's supreme. He's sovereign. Colossians 1.16, Jesus created all other powers and authorities. Verse 18, Jesus is the head of the church. He's the firstborn from the dead so that he might be preeminent in all things. Verses 20 to 22, the Father is pleased to reconcile all things to himself in Jesus through Jesus' sacrifice of himself upon the cross. And those who repent and believe now are brought into the people of God and under the rule of God and so are reconciled to God. Colossians 2.15, Jesus has already defeated all warring powers by his resurrection from the dead. The end has already been written. We're just waiting for it to be consummated. All this means that the kingdom of God is being established. It's already been inaugurated. And one day, all his people will be be united under his benevolent authority and in right worship of him. Creation, the entire created order, will be the sphere in which God's authority is known and loved and cherished. Jesus, come quickly. And brothers and sisters, it is in that hope by which we honor one another and serve one another. Jesus is building his church. The kingdom of God is being expanded. One day we will see it consummated with our own eyes and we will see our Savior face to face and we will dwell with God for all of eternity. God will dwell with us. And that is hope. And in the meantime, we labor in hope, not hopelessness. No matter how outrageous the politics, no matter how difficult the circumstances, no matter how unsettled the culture or the economy or the world becomes, 
It is this hope for the future, the kingdom of God, that fuels our labors in the present. And hope-fueled labor comforts one another. So Jesus calls us to the countercultural acts of honor, of service, of hope. And fourth, Jesus calls us to the countercultural act of praying rather than manipulating. Two weeks ago, Pastor Nick brought us this reminder from the beginning of chapter 4. Look at verses 2 through 4. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ, on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. And Nick reminded us that prayer is actually a vital part of mission. It's not incidental. It's not an extracurricular activity we can add on if we want to. No, if we are to be engaged in the mission of God here in Hill City in Chattanooga, Tennessee, then prayer is vital to the mission. And listen to how Paul honors Epaphras in this chapter in verse 12. Epaphras who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. For I am bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and in Hierapolis. Praying that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. When we as elders gather together for our meetings, we set aside time at the beginning specifically to pray for the members of this church by name. And this is the substance of our prayers, that you would stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. Some of you may feel like you, as an individual, have very little to offer sojourn by way of service. You have little to offer the church broadly, your church, your sojourn family. But that is nothing short of a lie from the enemy. If you simply gave yourself to prayer for this church family, for its members, for our worship, for your elders, for the deacons, that we would stand mature and fully assured in God's will, then your work, your labor for this church would be inestimable. Prayer is decidedly countercultural. Now, meditation and mindfulness, now, that's all the rage. But these are easily and often divorced from anything approaching biblical spirituality. But prayer, that hard work activity of setting aside quantifiable work in order to fellowship with your father through the son by his spirit to communicate your absolute dependence upon him in your weakness and in your frailty depending upon his power and his sufficiency this activity of prayer is much less trendy let's be honest it's not exactly hashtag trending to lay aside our self-sufficiency and human wisdom to intentionally remove distractions from our lives in order to create margins for prayer. But if we as a church family would give ourselves to the countercultural activity of prayer, then this one thing is certain. Regardless of what God would choose to do outwardly through us within our community, And we hope that he will do much in the days and weeks ahead to secure glory and honor and fame for himself in Hill City and the the city of Chattanooga by Sojourn and by other gospel preaching churches. We hope he will do much. But regardless of what he chooses to do there, he will most certainly do a work inwardly to change us if we give ourselves to prayer. Because we can't spend time with God without being changed. G.K. Beale puts it this way, we become what we revere, whether for ruin or restoration. 
If we revere God through the worship of prayer, we will be increasingly restored to the image of God. And who is that perfect image of God? The Lord Jesus Christ. And what delight is to be found for us there. So for one month, simply for the month of June, beginning a week from tomorrow, without laying any obligation upon you, and with no sense of expectation from us, Elizabeth and I would simply invite you to this building at 1230 on Monday afternoons during the lunch hour. We'll be here for half an hour simply praying, praying for sojourn. This won't be a time for fellowship, for teaching, for planning, for strategizing, just praying. And there's no expectation, only an invitation. But whether or not your schedule or your health or your desires allows you to join us at this specific time, Jesus is calling each of us to the countercultural activity of prayer. So what distractions do you need to lay aside this week to lean into that activity? How do you and I need to create more margin in our week so that prayer is not an afterthought, but a forethought? Honor, service, hope, prayer. Finally, Jesus calls us to the countercultural act of suffering over comfort. This is perhaps the most painful place to land, pun intended. Suffering is actually one of the reasons that some, after beginning to follow Jesus, will turn from following Jesus once they've begun. Suffering is one reason that individuals will refuse to follow Jesus to begin with. Listen to the words of Jesus from Matthew 13. Hear then the parable of the sower. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. Hear the warning in those words, to be sure, but hear also the patience and the grace of Jesus to warn us in advance, not just of suffering, but of the reality that suffering will tempt each of us in different ways to fudge on following Jesus. Hear the words of Paul. Before he leaves them with a blessing, he reminds them of his bondage. Verse 18, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Chains? Really, Paul? That's the note you want to end on? Thanks for that. After everything you've said about the gospel in this glorious little book, you want us to hold this in mind. You're in chains. That is the place the gospel had led Paul. So why on earth would someone willingly embrace Christ knowing that to do so is to embrace suffering in this life? The answer? Because Jesus is worth it. Because he really is the once dead, now resurrected and reigning king who will one day finally conquer all evil. Evil like school shootings and sexual abuse. And he will right all wrongs and he will reign in goodness and love. That's why, because Jesus is worth it. And in the meantime, to borrow from Paul Tripp, suffering destroys our self-reliance, it exposes our self-righteousness, it lays waste our idols while preparing us for God to use us. 
So brothers and sisters, here's the reality. It is quite possible that in our lifetime, or at least in the lifetime of the children in Sojourn Kids this morning, following Jesus in the U.S. will come at a steep cost. It has not been that way to this point. But it's quite possible that at some point there'll be economic cost to following Jesus. We'll lose business if we hold to the Bible. It will certainly be a relational cost. There'll be loss of friends and colleagues. It might be a financial loss, fines or confiscation of property or possessions. It might even be a cost of freedom. Do you recognize that there are laws on the books in both Australia and Canada currently that state if you counsel someone against practicing homosexuality or even if you pray with someone for power to follow Jesus in the area of sexuality, you can be fined and or imprisoned? Australia and Canada. Brothers and sisters, are you willing to be identified with the Lord Jesus in a way that embraces the way of Jesus on this side of heaven, recognizing that the way of Jesus is, is a way of tribulation and suffering before glory? Even for him, it was the cross before the crown. There is certainly joy and peace and hope in the midst of following Jesus. We cannot deny that reality. But we've been called not only to believe on his name, but also to suffer for his name. So the question this passage puts to us, as Paul says, remember my chains, is this. When the time comes, will we embrace suffering for the sake of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? Friends, these activities may seem overwhelming to embrace, but we do so empowered by the Spirit of Jesus and after the example of Jesus. After all, he himself honors those who honor him before men. Luke chapter 12. He gave himself not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Matthew chapter 20. He himself labored in hope for the joy that was set before him, enduring the cross, despising the shame, and is subsequently seated at the right hand of God. He chose sustained, faithful, consistent prayer with his Father over the unending work that was available to to him as he labored on earth over and over again. And he embraced suffering and trusting himself to his father who judges justly, knowing it was this path that led to life for himself and for all of his followers. So brothers and sisters, because we are united to Jesus, he calls us to counter-cultural acts. And may he give us grace to embrace them as a church family. Would you pray with me? Father, we are so grateful that even in this final paragraph of this incredible letter, as Paul names names, as he sends greetings, as he encourages and lifts up brothers and sisters, even this portion of scripture is profitable for us today 2,000 years later. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it meets us where we live right now, today, in this moment. And Father, I pray that you would give us grace by your spirit to embrace these countercultural acts. Make us to be a church family known for honoring one another, not shaming, for serving one another, not spectating, for hoping, not despairing, for praying, not manipulating, and for suffering, not embracing our comfort. And we pray these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.